Hi, my name is Steve Copen and welcome to this third and final video on the Nephilim Giant series. In this video, we're going to examine some of the global evidence of giants in ancient texts, legends, structures, and religions. Much of this material is included in my textbook, Religion, History, and Mystery. But here, for the sake of brevity, I'm only going to be able to share a fraction of that evidence. Firstly, a brief summary. Some of the oldest written records come from the Sumerians and Babylonians, and incidentally, there are various accounts of a global flood in over 200 ancient cultures. This is very important because giants are associated with the flood narratives. The oldest world cultures were fundamentally polytheistic, having many gods. The Sumerians worshipped 200 gods. Incidentally, the exact same number of angels mentioned in Enoch who ascended to Mount Hermon to change their bodies. But they also write of the main god, El, which is a shortened version of Elohim, the first name of God in the Bible, as is mentioned in the Enuma Elish text. In the Sumerian text called the Epic of Gilgamesh, El is going to flood the world and Gilgamesh, who is said to be one of the many giants of between three to seven meters tall, forced humans to help him build a huge boat to save himself and his other giant friends and relatives. This text is written as an explanation for why giants were living in the area after the global flood. Genesis 6-4 identifies the Nephilim as heroes of old, men of renown. These words come directly after the statement that angels and human women produce children, and the word Nephilim, which is gigantos in the Greek, simply means giant in the Septuagint of the Old Testament. The statement is plain. The children of these unions were giants who were heroes and renown, a reference to their reputation as great warriors compared to your average soldier. A well-armoured warrior of two to three times the height and strength of your average soldier would be almost invincible and a terrifying sight to those who fought against them. These giants became the subject of legend and, as we shall see, are mentioned in almost every ancient culture as gods who walked the earth or were the children of the gods. But what is often overlooked and is obvious from the ancient texts is their inherent lust for evil and hatred for those who are made in God's image. What kind of nature does a creature possess whose paternal father was a high-ranking fallen angel, a demon, a demon under the authority of Satan himself? Added to this are the many stories of their ability to perform supernatural acts of sorcery, witchcraft, occult power fueled by the blood of the most innocent of humanity, that is, babies, children, and virgins. The next verse in Genesis 6 states that with the introduction of the Nephilim giants, the wickedness of humanity had grown so great that, quote, every inclination of the thoughts of man was only evil all of the time. Now, if you can imagine an entire culture dedicated to murdering innocent children as a form of worship, a culture led by half-demon creatures who reveled in lust and death, then you can begin to imagine and have a clearer understanding of what led to the global flood. But their existence was not limited to before the flood. The Genesis text claims that they re-established themselves in the same way after the flood. And indeed, almost every story, myth, and legend and fact about them are from the post-flood era. Consider the following examples from history. This is the steel of Naram Sin and represents the Arcadian king Naram Sin who ruled in the area of Babylon. This is modern day Iran. He is twice as tall as his opponents and wears a bull's horn helmet, a common symbol of those associated with the worship of Mithra and Moloch. Moloch is commonly associated with sacrifice to Mithra. This is the sacrifice of especially children and babies. And it was a god of the gods, or in the Judeo-Christian tradition, Satan, who is the authority over all demonic principalities. The Sumerians, who ruled prior to the Babylonians, considered that their gods walked on the earth in human form, although much larger than normal people. And they also had supernatural powers, such as the sun god, which is pictured here. The civilization of the ancient Egyptians has been the focus of much debate, speculation, and mystery. According to Genesis 10, 
Mizraim, one of Ham's sons, became the founder of the Egyptian civilization and moved south after the flood. One of the oldest pieces of Egyptian art is the stone pellet from Heraconopolis, which celebrates the victory of King Nama. Now we know from later Egyptian writings that a family from the south conquered all of Egypt around 3000 BC and created the first dynasty in the capital of Memphis. The Egyptian name for this conqueror is Nama and also Menes. There are several pellets which portray the conquest of Nama, all which portray him as a giant of great stature. This first pellet portrays a great warrior who is twice the size of his subjects. In part of the scene, the headless bodies of what are supposedly enemies lay on the ground. This is on the right-hand side. The decapitation of enemies was a common form of human sacrifice among cultures who claim to have giant rulers. Notice also the priests carrying long poles with symbols of the gods leading a procession as part of this ritual sacrifice. In the second scene here, we see the giant holding the head of a victim and appears to be about to remove his head or bash his brains in with a club. And in this last pellet, he seems to be holding three enemies who are about to meet their end. All of these are about the same person. Now some scholars insist that the portrayal of Nama as a giant merely symbolizes his authority of a king. However, the pellets portray his battles to becoming the king of Egypt, rather than him sitting on the throne of Egypt. Moving east, facts concerning the ancient Chinese religions are very difficult to substantiate and differ considerably. The oldest known dynasty in China is the time of the three sovereigns and five emperors, from around 3000 to 2000 BC. The three sovereigns were considered to be god kings or demigods, physical beings of great stature and size who possessed powerful supernatural abilities. These three taught the people magic, how to cut stone and make fire, and instituted the shamans to serve them. They were said to be the sons of a great god, but born to human women. They divided China's rule between five emperors who served and worshipped him. They are pictured here in this very old and basic cave painting. Ancient Babylon is the modern-day Iran, and this word means land of the Aryans. A large group of Aryans migrated through Afghanistan, Pakistan, and northern India, a time known as the Indo-Aryan invasion around 2000 BC. The god of war Indra is depicted in the hymns of the Vedas, which were written at this time, the early Vedas, as a giant who led their worshippers in battle. He is said to be standing in a chariot which needed two horses to pull it, a being with superhuman strength who destroyed all who opposed him. Consider some of the Vedic lines from hymns 6, 7 and 8 to Indra. Those who stand near him as he moves feel his power. On his chariot is yoked the two great steeds that he loves, the bearers of the chief. Your followers throw off the state of unborn children and assume sacrificial names. Indra has near to him his two great steeds and chariot. He can see afar. He slays a thousand enemies with mighty and awful weapons. He is the irresistible ruler who drives the people with his might. He is our God and no other's. With his mighty missiles, he defeats his enemies. Now the Aryans brought with them the worship of Mithra and Moloch, which evolved into early Hinduism. Moloch was the central focus of child sacrifice and closely associated with astrology, going right back to the Tower of Babel and Taurus the Bull a theme which developed much further in the later Roman religion of Mithraism, where Roman soldiers were baptized in bull's blood and said to be reborn or born again. Statues of Moloch show him as seated or cross-legged with the head of a bull. A fire was built under the outstretched arms and hands of Moloch, which received the firstborn children of every citizen, thrown live into his hands to perish. This form of human sacrifice is well documented in the Old Testament of the Bible. The Pasupati seal, which is connected to the Hindu invasion, depicts Moloch cross-legged, 
his head as a bull, and legs as a huge bull. He is surrounded by symbols of the zodiac. Later, the Greeks had their hero Heracles, the son of the god Zeus and a human woman. He is called Hercules by the Romans, who also have multiple stories of the giant Titans who ruled the world from Atlantis prior to the flood. The famous philosopher Plato has a great deal to say about them. But what stands out in all of these ancient cultures, from both the Sumerians right through to the Romans, are the incredible amount of citations about wing gods who both directed the Nephilim or were said to appear for worship prepared by the priests of Moloch and Mitra. Now the god Mitra occurs in many ancient texts and consistently right through to the Romans. Mithra is depicted in several ways, but most commonly as an angel surrounded by signs of the zodiac. Christian scholars consider Mithra to be another name for Satan, and interestingly, he is portrayed as being embraced by serpents, one which crowns him, and another with the head of a goat. The Sumerian tablets also often portray their gods with wings, as in this tablet. And in this tablet, one can also identify the bullhorn helmets associated with Moloch. The Babylonians had Ishtar, among others, in this case, a female deity with wings. In the Zoroastrian tradition, the primary god Ahura Mazda is always depicted with wings. In the Avestas, the texts of Zoroastrianism, which were written around the same time as the earliest Vedas, we also find a hymn dedicated to Mithra which reads as follows. We worship Mithra, who, overtaking his opponents, overcome by passion together with manly valour, strikes down his opponents with a toss of his head, who cuts everything up. All at once he mixes together on the ground the bones, hair, brains, and blood of men who are false to the covenant. Now the obvious connections to giants, winged gods, sacrifice to Moloch, and worship of Mithra is consistent in all ancient writings. Here I have only had time to present a few of these connections. I would also point to the mysteries surrounding structures which we are unable to explain sufficiently. Consider the ziggurats of Central America, constructed for human sacrifice, and how these ziggurats are almost identical in form and purpose to those on the opposite side of the world in the Middle East. It is speculated that at the time of the flood the earth tilted on its axis, creating the north and south poles we have now. This would confirm the hypothesis of an ice age around five to 6,000 years ago. So did people cross the frozen Bering Strait and then headed south to Central America where it was warm and not frozen? There are many such structures which defy scientific inquiry. How were the stones erected at Stonehenge? Some of them are up to 30 tons in weight. How were these walls in Peru constructed with such precision? How were they moved into position because some of them are up to 100 tons? And what of the discoveries of ancient footprints embedded in bedrock or unearthed during earthquakes? And, dear friends, there are quite a lot of them. To get the general height of a person, you take the length of their foot and multiply by six. If the foot is one foot long or 30 centimetres, the person will be six feet tall or 180 centimetres. The footprints discovered range from 60 centimetres to almost a metre, which would mean the owners were from 3 to 6 metres tall. In this video, I have simply tried to give a taste of the vast amount of evidence for giants in ancient world cultures and their connections to forms of demonic worship and sacrifice. I have not mentioned the many stories, for example, of Native Americans who were hunted by red-haired giants, or the Olmec and the Mayans of Central America, or the roots of New Age religions. If these topics interest you, then I cover them in much greater detail in my textbook, Religion, History and Mystery. If you would like to discuss in detail a particular area that I've covered, please leave a comment below. Please also remember to like and subscribe to this video if it has been informative for you, and share it with others that may find it interesting. And I look forward to your comments below. God bless.